All right, income inequality, Noah Smith, Matthew Iglesias. One says inequality might be going down. The other says income inequality has been falling for a while now. Income inequality, talk of the town oftentimes from members of the left of center community uh, for good reason. Income inequality empirically isn't good for a number of reasons. Uh, and so insofar as you can limit income inequality to a reasonable degree with taxing and spending and economic structures, that's probably a good thing. Uh, and so let's uh, get a survey, it looks like, of where income inequality is in terms of how high it is, how low it is, the structures of it, and what's perhaps been causing it to go down, according to Noah Smith. So let's, uh, and Matthew Iglesias. So let's start off with Noah Smith. One name you don't hear a lot these days is Thomas Piketty. In 2013, the French economist burst into the popular consciousness with the publication of Capital in the 21st Century. The basic thesis was that, useless, that, was that unless extraordinary forces, war, or massive government action intervened, capitalism would naturally tend towards greater and greater inequality. That thesis is summarized by the famous and pithy formula R greater than G, meaning that if the rate of return on capital is greater than the growth rate of the economy as a whole, inequality mechanically increases. In Piketty's telling, only the extraordinary combination of the Great Depression, the New Deal, World War II, and rapid post-war growth managed to save, to save us from a social collapse due to spiraling inequality in the early 20th century. And now we're back in the danger zone. Here's the famous graph with some labels I added. Top, the top 1% share of income. Depression and redistribution here. The first Gilded Age here. War here, income inequality goes down, 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 rapid economic growth, and the second Gilded Age where income inequality appears to be going up quite a bit. In fact, particularly going up in the U.S. as the U.S. is the yellow line here. And this is, looks like it ends in 2010. I wonder if that's for a reason. Piketty's book was perfectly timed to coincide with an explosion of leftist political sentiment and popular unrest in an age where everyone needs data to back up their arguments. Piketty's inequality numbers were something solid and tangible that people could point to and argue that capitalism was naturally unstable and that the U.S. was in a moment of deep crisis. Progressives hammered home the message of a second Gilded Age in and day out, uh, day in and day out. In fact, they are still hammering it home. Robert Reich, former labor secretary under the Clinton administration, well-known progressive today, we're in the second Gilded Age, just like the first when America's wealth was in the hands of a few. Uh, conspicuous consumption uh, existed alongside homelessness and hunger. Monopolies destroyed competition. Money corrupted politics and government slided, sided with railroad barons over the workers. Inside the econ profession, meanwhile, the book sparked its share of fiery debates. The most dramatic moment was at the 2015 American Economic Association meeting when Piketty suggested that his critics were bought and paid for by the rich in uh, the more staid forms of papers and blogs. Economists found any number of reasons to take issue with Piketty. He ignored the costs of capital depreciation. He ignored the fact that much of the income from capital was actually income from land. His theory relied on some questionable assumptions about savings rates, etc. Some even argued that Piketty data, Piketty's data itself was unreliable. But essentially, no one questioned that inequality had risen a lot in the U.S., even if there was disagreement on the exact amount. As long as income and wealth kept getting less and less equitably distributed <clears throat> in the U.S., academic criticisms of Piketty's data and theory would remain well academic. Although a few stalwart defenders of laissez-faire capitalism insisted that inequality wasn't a problem, these arguments fell very flat. Most people don't think that a society can experience perpetually rising inequality without running into some sort of major social problems. So for a number of years, many of us thought uh, very hard about ways that inequality could be curbed before it got completely out of hand. I was in that camp that wanted to uplift the incomes of society's poorer members via cash benefits and faster economic growth. But anyway, then an interesting thing happened inequality started going down a little bit. The plateau and slight decline of U.S. inequality. First, let's talk about wealth inequality, which tends to get a lot of press in the U.S. This is the type of inequality that the new socialist movement, as well as left-leaning economists like Gabriel Zuckman, have tended to focus on the most. As you may have noticed, stocks crashed this year, and to a lesser extent, house prices fell too. A stock crash will tend to hurt the rich a lot more than it hurts middle class and poor people, since the rich collectively own most of the stock in America. And it'll hit the super rich especially hard, since their wealth is mostly made up of stock in the businesses they found. 
Elon Musk, the country's richest man, has lost $133 billion this year as Tesla's stock has fallen. Lost $133 billion in wealth uh, as Tesla's stock has fallen. And in fact, you can see this in the wealth numbers. A good source for these numbers is realtimeinequality.org, which displays data gathered by the economists Thomas Blanchett, Blanchett Emmanuel Sayez, and Gabriel Zuckman. People will argue about this data, but Sayez and Zuckman tend to find much higher inequality than others do, so these numbers are probably a worst-case scenario, and they show that wealth share of the top percentiles took a dip this year as the market crashed. You can see this crash as and its disproportionate effect on rich even more dramatically if you look at the absolute wealth numbers. Yeah. What's also interesting is that the recent dip follows about eight or nine years of plateau or even decline for the top wealth shares. It seems that right around the time Kennedy published the book, the trend of relentlessly rising wealth inequality that had been in place since around 1980 came to a halt. Now let's take a look at wage inequality. This is something that progressives aligned with the labor movement tend to look a lot at. Labor income inequality steadily rose from the late 1970s through the late 2010s, right around when, Piketty, when Piketty's book came out, and then plateaued. The wage shares of all four quartiles of the distribution, as well as the famous 1%, basically stabilized, with the top two quartiles falling a bit, and around the second poorest quartile rising a bit. Other data sources show an even more optimistic picture since the pandemic. A recent presentation by uh, Otter, Dube, and McGrew shows that although inflation has hurt everyone's real wages, for the bottom 10% of earners, the gains have outweighed the losses. Wage inequality, real wage trends by quintile. You can see here the real wage growth of the bottom 10% has maintained itself over this pandemic. Something that I tried to explain to Rob Knorr during one of our debates, which uh, to my to my failing, I wasn't able to explain in a way that, that he would agree, uh, but, you know, who knows. Workers with only a high school education have also seen their wages increase faster than their more educated counterparts. As you can see on the chart, this wage compression began well before the pandemic. The red line goes up more than the blue or green. The authors find that this pre-pandemic drop in wage inequality happened entirely in states that raised their minimum wages, which suggests that policy might have played a role here. Yeah, and that's probably a good point. I think that throughout uh, time, the history of the minimum wage is that the minimum wage, it, it turns out that... It doesn't have incredibly large disemployment effects. It does have a redistributional effect. In the in in effect, it it causes lower income people to be paid more, right? Uh, and you know, if if you're making eight dollars an hour and the minimum wage gets raised to eleven, uh, it turns out more likely than not, you're just going to end up making eleven dollars an hour, and you're not going to get fired or laid off, and you know your your prices aren't going to get raised so to such an extent that you're you're going to real terms lose money, and so the minimum wage. As much as you know, many economic wonks or people like that like to say it's bad based on this economic theory or whatever it is, I mean, empirically, it seems to work out just fine, and it seems to result in lower income people getting more money in their pockets. You know, obviously, that's up to a certain amount. You know, you can't make the minimum wage twenty-eight dollars an hour overnight, uh, but you know, these these marginal and sort of meteoric increases in the minimum wage tend to be pretty positive for lower income people. Otter, Dube, and McGrew don't know exactly why the wage compression is happening. They find evidence suggesting that labor market tightness due to fast growth and the overheated economy plays a role. But they also find evidence that job switching has increased since the pandemic and that low-wage workers who switch jobs have much bigger raises. This suggests that the labor market isn't just tighter now, it's also more competitive. Now, it's important to what he, what he means by more competitive. He means more competitive from the buy side of labor, if I'm not mistaken. Basically, the idea is that uh, if you if you imagine a labor market where you've got uh, the market of labor, the supply and the demand for labor, well, the supply of labor, you know, where, where the, the graph goes up as wages increase, the supply goes up, that is the workers themselves. And the demand for labor is the businesses, where as wages go up, you know, the demand lowers, sort of quantity demanded. Um, and when he says more competitive, he, he means for businesses where companies are now having to pay higher for different employees because employees are starting to switch jobs more often, right? 
As for total income, which includes not just wages, but also rental income, government cash, benefits, etc., that's more complicated picture. Realinequality.org shows a plateau around 2013, similar to wealth and wage inequality, but no recent compression. But a recent paper by Laramore, Mortensen, and Splinter, ooh, Splinter, okay, shows the government benefits, including COVID relief, have boosted the incomes of the poor relative to others. I mean, that makes sense to me. It's important to note that the drop in inequality are all very modest, all only enough to cancel out the rise in inequality that happened in years immediately following the financial crisis, and certainly not yet enough to reverse the long trend of the 1980s, 90s, and early 2000s, and this could just be a temporary reprieve. But the failures of inequalities continue to rise since Piketty's book came out, uh, came out, since Piketty's book came out, suggests that predictions of an imminent, imminent crisis of capitalism was overdone. This as much as any academic pushback. This, as much as any academic pushback, may be why we don't hear Piketty's name thrown around as much these days. Damn. Really in indicting the potential legacy of Thomas Piketty. <laughs> why is inequality going down, and can the drop be sustained? Whether the drop in inequality will be sustained depends in part on why it's happening. This isn't possible to know yet, but we can start to make some guesses. On the wealth side, the most important factor is just the stock market. In a recent post, I listed a number of reasons that the U.S. stock returns could be more moderate than we're used to over the coming decade. This post, do people really still think stocks will return 10%? This is an old article by Noah Smith about a month ago. These reasons include U.S.-China decoupling and deglobalization in general, meaning less opportunity for overseas profits, slower population growth, higher interest rates, a reinvigorated antitrust movement, meaning less growth in profit margins, and the fact that stock valuations are still pretty high in historical terms. If stocks do yield more modest returns over the next decade, that will compress wealth inequality further. On the income side, policy choices matter a lot. Doob and others have shown that, that minimum wage increases, which I should note don't seem to have resulted in any sort of mass unemployment anywhere so far, are effective in compressing wages. Whether the labor movement really manages to unionize restaurants and warehouses, etc. will make a difference too, as will government cash benefits. Big factors like deglobalization and AI could have an important impact too, and there's a question of whether the Fed's rate hikes will send us into a recession, but I think the most important factors, at least in the long term, in the long term are going to be driven by our democratic policy choices. In other words, even if Piketty's direst warnings were overdone, and even if the leftists who cited his research to warn the coming collapse of capitalism were blowing hot air, there seems to have, a, have been a core of truth to what Piketty wrote. Ultimately, it was a combination of government action, a stock crash, tight labor markets, and deglobalization, if not yet a major war, that curbed the upward trend of rising inequality, just as Piketty might have predicted. But it also seems possible that this demonstrates not the fundamentally instability not the fundamental instability of the democratic capitalist systems, but their fundamental self-correcting stability. Stock prices can outpace fundamental economics for a long time, but probably not forever. An economy that focuses on cultivating highly educated workers will eventually find itself in need of laborers and their wages will rise. Globalization can progress for a long time, but eventually export markets and overseas investment opportunities get saturated. And if low-end workers get the shaft for long enough, eventually they'll get mad and come up together to vote for increases in wages and benefits. And perhaps people like Piketty, who arrive at the peak of inequality to issue dire warnings, are themselves a crucial part of the stabilization mechanism that brings inequality back down. I hope so anyway. Knock on wood. Update. Here are some other numbers from Michael Strain and John Voorhees showing a plateau in wage inequality in the early 2010s and a drop beginning in the late 2010s. Strain also points out that the Gini coefficient of income after taxes and transfers also stopped going up around the early 2010s. Well, pretty good article overall. I mean, I think it paints a somewhat convincing picture that inequality has at the very least stagnated, if not gone down. So I think... It's a good article from Noah Smith initially. The next day, Matthew Iglesias comes out with his very own article. He says, Noah Smith's article isn't good enough. I have to come up with my own. Also, I am the same person as Noah Smith. And so I've now released income inequality has been falling for a while now. Obama, Biden economics are accomplishing more than people realize. So Matthew Iglesias taking a slightly harder stance than Noah Smith, who's simply saying that income inequality might be going down. Matthew Iglesias taking... Certainly the, the, the more definitive stance that income inequality has been falling for a while. And it's apparently because, at least in part, of Obama-Biden economics. So let's read about this.
Matthew Iglesias. Inequality garnered a lot of political attention during Obama's first term as president for a bunch of pretty good reasons. First and foremost, of course, was the huge financial crisis followed by emergency rescue measures and a steep recession. And even though the economy recovered from the recession, the pace of recovery wasn't symmetrical to the pace of the collapse. We got a slow, difficult labor market recovery in stark contrast to a stock market that bottomed out a couple of weeks after Obama's inauguration and rose rapidly from there. This was uh, disquieting. This was a disquieting situation. I think the upshot is somewhat banal. The Obama administration should have been willing to cut deals with Republicans to extend regressive tax cuts in exchange for more stimulus spending. And the Federal Reserve should have signaled more tolerance of mild inflation, but the administration didn't take these steps, so the field was wide open for big ideas about what had gone wrong. And one plausible culprit was inequality, which had risen a lot in the prior 30 years. It rose in particular on a Reaganite promise that making public policy less distri uh, distributive would generate a rising tide lifting all boats dynamic. Instead, the Reagan administration's policies led to stagnant average wages through the 1980s, with household incomes rising only because of women's increased labor force participation. Despite some good years in the late 1990s, inequality still looked quite bad in the 21st century, and by 2014, CPI-adjusted median household income was still lower than it had been 15 years earlier. A striking fact that generated a lot of commentary even though the country had clearly experienced a lot of innovation and GDP growth during that period. This set the tone for the economic policy conversation towards the end of Obama's presidency, during which time Bernie Sanders became an unexpectedly successful presidential primary candidate and Donald Trump got elected president on a more populist economic message than recent Republican candidates. In 2017, though, updated economic data showed that by the end of Obama's term, median wages and household income were at all-time highs. But with the general tumult of Trump's presidency, the pandemic, and January 6th, the economy largely fell out of a busy news cycle to the point where I find many people don't realize that inequality has actually been declining since the Great Recession. Not by enough to undo the run-up to the 1980s and 90s, but enough to alter our understanding of recent political economy and trends. Obama's policies reduced inequality. I often wish more people paid attention to the fact that government data is released with a lag that those... Uh, and that those lags vary. Information about the stock market updates daily, information about unemployment updates with about a month lag, but information on median household income takes years to update, and so sometimes a narrative will get locked in even though it's already outdated on the merits. I think that very much is the case for the Obama years, where the correct observation that the economy, rec the recovery from the Great Recession was too slow, curled into a narrative of a long-term economic decline. Pulling back a little bit, we can see that the median income was growing rapidly by the end of Obama's term, and that overall growth recorded from 1990 to 2020 was quite good. In 2014, we peaked in 1990, was true, but by Trump's inauguration, it was true that the average American family had never had it so good. We had three years of continuing growth under Trump, and although that was temporarily derailed by the pandemic, I think that unlike during the recovery from the financial crisis, the economic costs have largely not implicated economic policy. So what happened to inequality during the Obama years? This past November, we finally got the Congressional Budget Office's report, the distribution of household income 2019, which lets us assess economic conditions between the financial crises and the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. The report finds three important things about inequality. Taking the long view, the Gini coefficient, the most comprehensive summary, of, uh, summary measure of inequality, rose considerably between 1979 and in 2019. Over 100% of the increase took place between 1979 and 2007. Between 2007 and 2019, the Gini coefficient fell 5%. During this whole period, the tax and transfer system in the United States had become more egalitarian. This last point is interesting and easy to lo lose track amidst uh, the back and forths of the political system, but in the United States and every country, as far as I'm aware, the Gini coefficient is lower after taxes and transfers, and it's possible to track how much lower it is after taxes and transfers, and how much this changes over time. There you can see that the system did get less redistributive under Reagan, but has been getting more redistributive since the big tax reform in 1986, and there was a particularly large increase in redistributiveness associated with the Obama administration raising taxes on the rich in order to expand the welfare state, mostly Medicaid expansion and ACA subsidies. Reduction in income inequality stemming from means-tested transfers and federal taxes 1979 to 2019. You can see here, smaller reduction in income inequality, larger reduction in income inequality. Uh, and you can see in the 1980s, uh, well, I mean, he's right. Yeah, Reagan basically made our taxes and spending less redistributive, less generous. And then since, I guess, about 19, 
uh, 90, it looks like that's been going down and down and down. So you get more of a reduction in income inequality from means tested programs. And it appears that this peaked out in about, you know, I don't know, 2015, 2016 here. And then it goes up a bit under Trump, uh, who, you know, made some marginal differences in our in our food stamps and, you know, welfare programs in general. The Obama administration's policymaking is not beyond criticism, but I do think the facts laid out in this report offer a considerably different context for assessing the administration's economic track record. The left has often portrayed Trump's win as, on some level, a punishment for the failures of neoliberalism with its endless inequality and stagnant wages, and a lot of elite-level thinking in progressive circles during the Trump years was driven by a determination to avoid the mistakes of Obama Obamaism rather than to try and replicate its success successes. It's easy to forget now that he's president, but Joe Biden received almost shockingly little elite support for a former vice president until very late in the cycle. He was seen as offering Obamaism 2.0 and was deemed unacceptable by people who saw Obama as a failure. But if you understand the Obama record as successfully altering the inequality trajectory and bringing medium incomes to an all-time high, that casts his other achievements, lower greenhouse gas emissions, marriage equality, etc., in a different context and makes the idea of let's beat Trump and keep on going uh, and, keep, and keep on keeping on look more plausible. Inequality reduction has continued under Biden. During the recession, incomes during a recession, incomes fall almost by definition, and the COVID-19 pandemic induced a doozy of a recession. From a policy perspective, compared to 2007 to 2009, the U.S. government chose a number of levels to take the hit in the form of elevated inflation rather than elevated unemployment. In retrospect, we clearly erred too much on the side of inflation. I'm not sure if that's necessarily true, personally. But if we try to navigate these choppy waters without ever going ever over 2% inflation, then unemployment would have been dramatically worse. Better policy could have improved outcomes somewhat, but the big problem is that the pandemic itself left us poorer. That being said, ignoring the pandemic boom and bust, inflation-adjusted median earnings in the third quarter of 2022 were higher than they were in the third quarter of 2019 and less than 2% lower than in the pre-pandemic quarter. If we have normal economic growth this year, we'll be at a new all-time high. There's more to life than median, of course, but David Otters finds that we've actually seen much stronger than median wage performance, much stronger than median wage performance among the lowest wage workers. And this is the same graph from what we saw in Noah Smith's article. Jeff Larry Moore from the Federal Reserve and Jacob Morenston and David Splinter from Congress Joint Committee on Taxation look at a slightly different set of data and find that workers in the bottom 20% of the distribution, medium real wage uh, earnings, including fiscal relief, increased 66% in 2020, and earnings increases offset relief decreases in 2021 recovery. This good news for low-income workers is easy to miss. You've probably read stories like this one from Jenna Smilik and Ben Castleman, arguing that poor are suffering the greatest hardship due to inflation. That framing in part reflects the generalized negativity bias of the media, but also note that it's subtly distinct claim. Aspects of the inflationary economy, especially higher prices for basic food commodities, are bad news for everyone. But richer people have an easier time writing out bad news than poorer people. That's true even though incomes have risen for the, po for the poorest and fallen for the richest. To consider an extreme example, uh, there's been plenty of coverage of the large decline in Meta's stock market valuation over the past year, but nobody's going to write a tearjerker story about the personal economic hardship facing Mark Zuckerberg and his family when you're a mega billionaire, even huge financial losses paired with a rising grocery prices don't make it hard for you to afford food. But if we want to understand the Biden economy, we need to keep these things in mind. A more egalitarian tax policy passed in 2022 and hasn't taken effect yet. The pre-tax wage distribution has gotten more equal. Median outcomes have been bad due to inflation, but a lot of this is the illusion of enormous inflation-adjusted gains during the worst of the pandemic. The upshot is that if we can avoid new rounds of commodity shocks, we'll be able to pair an egalitarian growth trajectory with positive outcomes for the median and set all kinds of new highs, uh, new high points for well-being. Building on success. The upshot is that the people who care about egalitarian economics should take a more positive view of the recent trends and a more risk-averse attitude towards the future. For example, one thing that could ruin the story of egalitarian progress would be if President Ron DeSantis sweeps into office in 2024 with a half a dozen new Republican senators and enacts the kind of draconian Medicaid cuts he repeatedly voted for as a House member. If you think we are failing on broadly shared growth in the present, you may be inspired to neglect downside risks. 
but simply achieving zero change in the tax and transfer policy baseline, which has taxes on the rich set to go up thanks to the IRA, would be a significant win. That's not to say that we shouldn't seek continued policy changes, but rather than thinking in terms of big structural change or a political revolution, it makes more sense to look at the long list of potential pro-growth, pro-equality regulatory changes that could be enacted on a bipartisan basis. Ongoing efforts to improve the refundability of the child tax credit would also do a lot to improve the economic outlook for the poorest, and Medicaid expansion was the biggest egalitarian triumph of the Obama years, but it still hasn't reached Texas, Florida, and several other states. Democrats have managed to win successful pro-Medicaid electoral campaigns in places as red as Kansas and Kentucky, so it should be possible to achieve the same in Texas and Florida. Part of the difficulty, I think, is that Texas and Florida are purple enough that local Democrats haven't run Kelly slash Basheer style campaigns and instead keep hoping that you can win as a mainstream Democrat in states that Trump carried comfortably in 2020. There's a big opportunity to move policy left by issuing uh, uh, by by issue positioning right. Oh, man, that's the this might be the most controversial thing in this whole article right here. A big opportunity to move policy left by issuing uh, by issue positioning to the right. Hmm. It's an interesting statement. It would also obviously be the be ideal to avoid a new recession in 2023 or 2024. The Fed raised interest rates a lot this past year in an effort to fight inflation, and inflation, though still high, has been trending downward. I hope they'll be a lot more measured in the pace of increases going forward, uh, and that as long as inflation continues to trend downward, there won't be too much worry about accelerating the trend. Conversely, Congress and the White House need to do everything possible to enact supply-side reforms that will keep growth on track. The overall point here, though, is that uh, while I think everyone acknowledges that the years 2009-2022 saw a lot of progress on LGBTQ rights and clean energy, it's widely held that the Obama-Biden approach failed in economic equality. That just isn't true. The biggest bump in the road was Donald Trump enacting massive, uh, enacting a regressive tax cut and came very close to enacting big Medicaid cuts. The big risk to the project in the future is the risk of losing an election so badly that the welfare state rolled back uh, the, the welfare state rollback agenda gets a new lease on life. But Obama presided over a gently growing economy and the passage of big egalitarian tax and spending initiatives. Biden has made more modest pro-equality tax changes, but is also running on running a full employment economy that is delivering large gains to workers at the bottom of the distribution. Continued application of the spirit of political pragmatism and empirical rigor could easily lead to further gains. There's no reason to risk everything on radical throws of the dice. Well, Matthew Iglesias, in typical neolib fashion, got to sideswipe the leftists of the democratic movement. But, you know, I think he offers some good economic analysis uh, here. And I think Noah Smith does as well. It is interesting to, to see that income inequality is stagnated and, 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 and gone down. And there have been some good moves in that regard. I think that it has been interesting that the bottom 10, 20 percent of workers have seen real wage increases throughout this inflationary period, which means that they're you know, they've been able to get uh, eight, nine, 10 percent raises pretty consistently over the last two years. Um, aggregately, that's been true. Um, and so it's interesting that the narrative that I debated Rob Nor about about a year and a half ago or a year ago, it feels like um, has actually held true that that the, the, the inflation pain has really mostly been felt on uh, people between 20 percent and sort of 80th percentile of the income distribution because anyone in the top you know 20 10 5 1 percent are probably able to weather it despite their real incomes going down but then people in the 20 to 80th percentile are getting real decreases in their wages and it's probably hurting them a lot more than people in the bottom 20 percent because their real wages have actually increased so interesting articles hope you guys enjoyed. it